and welcome, welcome. There are a lot of people that worked really hard to make this night happen, and so all of us are very happy to see all of you. Uh, I want to acknowledge, can some of the people in the committee that um, participated in helping this happen please stand up so we can thank you? I know you're all shy, just do it. I include you. Stand up, stand up. Okay, that's you. Hey, you guys, come on. All right, all right. So there's a lot of people that made this happen, so we're really happy. Um, and some quick housekeeping things before I launch in is, um, I can't say this in Spanish, so I apologize, but if you are here and you are more comfortable listening to this presentation in Spanish, there are interpreters and interpretation services available for you in the back. Can you, wherever you, I can't see very well up here. Can you, I'd say where you are, if that's, okay, just in, in the, oh, I see, over, okay, over in the corner. So if that's uh, something that's helpful to you, and I apologize, I can't say that in Spanish, that's a failing I have, but it's in the back. All right. Okay, so my name is Dawn Watkins, and I am the executive director for the Multigenerational Center in Fortuna, and I'm also the chair of the board of the Humboldt County Domestic Violence Coordinating Council. And I am unbelievably honored to be able to be up here and um, introduce this for you. But before we get started, and some of you will know exactly what I'm about to do, before we get started, I do want to take a minute to acknowledge that we are on, we, we are on We Ought Land. It's something I always like to do before we start any gathering. Um, yes, we are in the Humboldt County Office of Education, amazing Sequoia building. We are also in the city of Eureka and the county of Humboldt, but since the beginning of time and since forever to the end of time, this will always be We Ought Land. And so we are grateful and appreciative of their gratitude and sacrifice that lets us be here. So I want to acknowledge that before we start. Um, I first became aware of John Powell's work in 2012, which is really late in his career. That would have been <laughs> something like that, because he is an amazing. He is currently, uh, Mr. Powell is the director of the Haas Institute uh, for Racial Inclusion. Did I get that right? For, sorry, for a fair and inclusive society. Jeez, I, always, I knew I was going to screw that up. He is the director of the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society. He is also a professor of law and of African American and ethnic studies at UC Berkeley and holds the Haas Chancellor's Chair for Equity and Inclusion. He is a well-known, extremely um, respected act. Uh, he's a, a writer and um, advocate for civil rights and civil liberties all over the world and has written extensively on issues about race and structural racialization, uh, issues such as poverty and democracy and homelessness, and has really generously shared his wise and gentle spirit all over the world for a long, long time. And so we are very honored to have him here with us tonight, for sure. I understand he was at Humboldt State today, and it was a sold out in the hallway crowd. So that's a pretty awesome thing. Um, and um, we we're really, really happy to hear that. Like I said, I actually became really aware of John Powell's work in 2012. And as I said, that was a really late in his career, because by then he'd been going strong for a very long time. <laughs> and um, I was working on writing a grant uh, for uh, for an agency I was working for at the time through the Blue Shield Against Violence Foundation. And I was looking really hard for, um, re I needed really strong research for what I was doing. Because the grant at the time was on something, and I can't, I've been trying to remember the exact name of the grant. Four years ago on a grant cycle is a long time. It was something like providing cultural, providing cultural relevant services to victims of domestic violence. Or no, cultural, culturally competent services to victims of domestic violence. And, and um, that was something that Blue Shield Against Violence, the Blue Shield Against Violence Foundation was really, really involved in at that time. They still are. And I don't mean in any way to diminish the work they were trying to do, but what they had in mind for this funding was they wanted us to look at our policies and they wanted us to look at our procedures and to look at making our spaces that we actually served people in to be more welcoming. And I wanted the money, but I didn't want to do it the way they wanted me to do it. Anybody know me, any of you that know me know that's exactly what I would do, is not want to do it the way I was told. So, um, <laughs> but I was really, but I wanted to do it right. I mean, I really felt really strongly that this was a, a, pro, that this was a problem, specifically in our region, because if you think about this for a second, I mean, I, I'm not trying to demean myself, but I'm, 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 a, I'm a white girl from Baltimore, Maryland, and I could not for the life of me think of how I was going to make a culturally inclusive place for 11 Native American tribes tribes, the Hmong community, a very diverse Hispanic community, a very diverse just general community of color. We have everybody here. And I just couldn't, I didn't feel comfortable 
people bringing my staff together to have a conversation without bringing all of them in. And this was not in the RFP. I mean, this was not something that they were going to pay for me to do, which was bring people together to have this conversation. And so I was really adamant about it. And, um, but, I, I, but I didn't really have the right language. I just felt righteous about it, and I didn't really know exactly how to, what to say. And I believe one of my interns um, brought me the book, which is actually for sale outside. Um, Racing to Justice. It was amazing. I think it. I don't think it had been published yet. It was just there in it. So if you haven't, um, so all the HSU interns. I know a lot of you are here. Um, always look to them for information if you need it, because that really book really changed everything. Anyway, I don't want to go on too much about it. But basically, the gist of it was, I didn't want to. I did not want to create a culturally relevant policy manual. I wanted to be culturally relevant, and I felt like it was really important to engage those communities in this conversation before I could actually start to even think about providing services. So, in the, so the sort of it was, in the end, it took a lot of conference calls, a lot of writing, but in the end, I actually did get the grant, which was pretty cool. I didn't get to stick around to see the uh, implementation of it, but it, I'm still pretty proud of that. And it sounds like it's not a big deal, like all I did was, you know, challenge an RFP, but the reality was I actually got in a lot of trouble. And, uh, but that's okay. I was pretty proud of it, and I appreciate the work that you did. And I did cite you properly in the application, so I thank you. <laughs> I thank you for that. Um, but Humboldt County, there's a lot of people that are going to say that Humboldt County is, is not, that racial issues are not important in Humboldt County. They're going to, they're going to say that. And, um, and I, I want to I say that I, I'm going to disagree with that. Um, I think people say that because we are blessed to be really culturally diverse. We have a lot of really great things to offer. There's a lot of amazing resources here, both culturally, both the people. I mean, and HSU has done an amazing group, I mean, excuse me, an amazing job of recruiting people to come here um, from all over the region and all over the community. And we've really done a lot to increase the actual numbers of diversity that are here. But the reality is, if you really look at the, uh, it's not this big mistake mysterious thing, and I'm not calling anybody out, but if you really want to look at the state of race relations in Humboldt County, you need to look at who holds the power. And I don't mean who, I'm not talking about the police, and I'm not talking about government, I'm talking about like day-to-day -day power. Like for example, who is on the boards of the nonprofits that you support and work for or look to provide services to? And who is on the boards of the foundations that give out money? You know, there's that. Who is on the school boards? Who are actually the community leaders? And what agencies do they work for? And what power do they actually have in the community? Who gets to make the decisions? And who gets to decide where the money goes? If you just take a real quick look at that, you know, you'll tell, you'll learn a lot about what race looks like in, in Humboldt County. And um, I'm not, like I said, I'm not really calling anybody out. It's just something to look at. It'll, it'll tell you a lot. Um, you know, my own son, and if you want to look at what an even more identity basis, my son goes to a school that's 14% Spanish-speaking people, and yet if you walk down the street of our town, you'd be hard-pressed to see anybody of color walking around. They're made to feel invisible, so they've become invisible. It's a really interesting dynamic that we have there. But people don't want to talk about race, and I think they don't want to talk about it because there's a lot of fear involved. There's a lot of fear. People are afraid to say the wrong thing. People are afraid to say the right thing and then be held accountable or be held responsible for what it is they just said. Sometimes people are going to be afraid that something's going to change or they're going to have to lose something or give up something if they make the right point. And uh, I think that really is what stops a lot of the conversations from happening. But I want to say that what I'm encouraging you all to do tonight, so friends, what I'm encouraging you to do is to step out of your comfort zone and really be willing to have these fearless conversations. Because it's not like I've become, I'm not an expert in this. I actually am really honored that I'm allowed to be up here. But I'm not an expert in these things. I think it's just a matter of like once I started to see things, I just really couldn't unsee them. And I knew that it was kind of a, a thing that I really had to keep working for. Even if I made every mistake in the world, and I've definitely make them and I continue to make them. But I'm just encouraging all of you, like friends, to step out of your comfort zone and be willing to have these conversations. And if you're comfortable with this conversation, gently draw people into your comfort zone so this actually can move forward. Um, that's what I want. I think it's what I want to say about that. And I, you know, in the words of, Do uh, we lost another big, uh, big, big spiritual and political leader this week when Father Dan Berrigan um, passed away at the age of 94. He was a really strong influence on me in my early political and spiritual life, for sure. And, and he said, actually, to me personally, which I'll never forget, but also he's known for the quote, which is, you don't do the work, you, know, you, do, what was it? you do the work because you know it's right, not because you know how it's going to turn out. You, you, always, you, just, you just do the work. 
And so that's what we're here to do. And that's what we're here for Mr. John Powell to talk to us about. So I just want to say on behalf of, I'm going to, I'm going to leave somebody out. So if I do, I really apologize. But on behalf, of, on behalf of the Smolin Foundation and the Footprint Foundation, the Humboldt Area Foundation, Humboldt State University, the, the California Endowment, St. Joseph Health, I feel like an NASCAR. I don't think first five, see, there's so many, first five, there's so many people that work together to bring this. And so, um, but on behalf of all of those people, thank you for coming and um, we welcome Mr. John Powell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good evening. Good evening. So uh, I can already tell I'm not in the Black Baptist Church. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. You're just talking. <laughs> uh, it really is a delight to be here. And I want to thank uh, the Humboldt Area Foundation and all the foundations, certainly the California Endowment. But mostly I want to support and thank you for being here. Uh, you could be someplace else. Um, and some of you I saw earlier, a uh, nice group of folks to come out. And this work is really important, and it's going to have a huge impact on our life in the world, whether we want, to, want it to or not. And it's important to try to get it right, or at least move us in the right direction. So I'm going to share some thoughts and, and um, impressions of the work, and then at the end there'll be time for questions. And then... There'll be people from the Haas Institute coming back to work with you in the future. Uh, I have a, a great staff over here, if you'll stand up. They've been working uh, to... Uh... <laughs> bring you this information and make me look good. And that's a hard job, but, <laughs> uh, but I appreciate them. So today I'm going to be talking about a little bit about structure, but mainly about the mind science, implicit bias. The mind science actually are many things. It's not just implicit bias. It's also stereotype threat, anxiety. It's basically how the mind works. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that and why that's relevant in terms of the work that we're all doing. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about what are some of the interventions we can make and hopefully leave you some tools and some concepts that will help as you go forward. It's always important to sort of understand what the problem is. Uh, the human beings actually seek meaning and we actually seek problems. They've seen this with not only human beings but even with chimpanzees, uh, our cousins. Um, we actually like to solve problems. You know, they're saying one of the ways you keep the brain, the brain placid is to do puzzles. Or do the brain likes problems. So we have a great problem for you to work on. Uh, it's the problem of othering. And I use the term othering deliberately. We use it. We had a big conference last year on othering and belonging. And I use that term because sometimes if you talk about race or if you talk about gender, if, no matter what you talk about, somebody feels left out. It's like, what about me? What about the problems that my community is having? And we all have different problems. And many of the problems that we're talking about are really problems about othering and who belongs. So I run this thing at Berkeley called the Haas Institute. There are seven different clusters and they're organized around LGBTQ, gender, poverty, race, disability, religion, and so on. And I'm thinking, so what does all these things have in common? And all of them are about how groups of people, what we do to groups of people to say, you don't belong. And it's not just a word, it's not even necessarily conscious. We organize space, we organize symbols, we organize stories, we organize money, we organize resources. As Don said, we organize who sits on the board of directors to, to say, this is not your place, that you're a guest in somebody else's house. And that has a huge impact on every aspect of our life. It literally affects how long we live. It affects uh, how much money we, we make. It affects our health. It affects how well we do in school, how well we do on the job. So it's actually quite important to actually gra grapple with this issue of othering and belonging. 
is not a United States problem, it's a global problem. Uh, the world is changing very fast, I mean, but very fast. Uh, we actually notice a change happening in the United States. We don't pay attention to what's happening in Europe. We don't pay attention to what's happening in Africa, in Latin America. One of the things about the world being mo very mobile is that people are moving and it's becoming very diverse. So we have religions, language, customs, race, um, all these things sort of bumping up against each other in relatively small space. Now we have several different ways in which we organize our identities. And some of them are more well-known than others. We tend to understand that how much stuff we have somehow matters. In fact, we're a society that's obsessed with stuff. Uh, and we sort of almost think that whoever has the most stuff at the end of life wins. Uh, I don't think that's quite true, but anyway, that's how we organize most of our society. Um, you know, you go to some places literally and they'll say, bigger is better, bigger is better. So why? You know, uh, and, um, and so we think that people make decisions based almost entirely on stuff. We're going to give you more money. We're going to give you uh, more, a bigger house. Um, and so much so that when... Uh, Frank, Tom Frank went to Kansas and people were making choices not based on money in terms of supporting political candidates who would not line their pocket. He wrote a book saying, what's the matter with Kansas? Uh, and someone else wrote another book saying, what's the matter with Frank? Uh, <laughs> because when we think about it, we all know that we're not just economic animals. Uh, if we did, we wouldn't have children, and if we had them, we wouldn't keep them. Uh, <laughs> there are other things in life that are important, uh, and part of those things for all of us is love, is spirituality, is the communities that we are, live in. I, I held the Marvin uh, Kropatkin Fellowship um, a chair when I was at the University of Minnesota, and that won't mean anything to you, but he represented Native American tribes uh, around uh, Wounded Knee. And he changed the laws so that the tribes could sue the United States to get money for stealing the land. And he brought the suit and they won. And the government created a trust fund and put millions and millions of dollars in there to pay for the land. And that money is still there. This was in the 1950s. Because the tribe was saying, the land is sacred. That's an insult to pay us for our mother. Uh, and that was in the 1950s. There's a case like that now pending in Hawaii. So again, we all understand there's some things that money can't buy and shouldn't buy. And the thing that we don't focus on very often is who are we, what do we need in terms of our collective sense of self, in terms of our spirit, in terms of our soul. And to some extent, and I don't know if you're right or left or in the middle or, you know, you don't really care. Uh, in some ways, the right wing has been better at that, of speaking to people's concern about the meaning of life, of speaking about values. Um, I won't hide the ball. My father, mother, they're from the South. They are, uh, were sharecroppers, so we grew up economically very poor, but family very rich. I have a large family, I'm six of nine. I'm not a bork. Uh, and the at one point, my dad, who was part of the union when he moved to Detroit, he was thinking about voting for uh, the second Bush. And, um, and he understood that Bush probably wasn't going to help black people in Detroit economically. And I said, Dad, why would you vote for him? He said, you know, my father's a Christian minister. He's now 95 years old. He said, um, because I don't believe in gay marriage. And he was willing to trade his economic interests out for his moral interests. Um, and we had many, many conversations about that. Um, happy to say my dad didn't vote for Bush. Uh, <laughs> and he's come around to understanding why gay marriage might be okay. But he was coming at it from a spiritual perspective that had to be protected. I couldn't start off by saying there was something wrong with my father for having a different perspective. 
One of the things that's happening in the world that's driving a lot of this is the growing diversity. Robert Putnam went to Europe in the 1980s and 90s, and he noticed that Europe was actually going through fundamental changes. It was changing along some salient axis of identity, that there were a lot of Muslims coming to Europe. There are more blacks living in Paris than live in Philadelphia. The majority of children in the Amsterdam school are not from the country. They, uh, and so we only are reading about it now in terms of immigration and refugee. And the Europeans are trying to figure out what's going on. And what Putnam wrote about in the 1980s and 90s was this changing, growing diversity would generate deep anxiety. Deep anxiety. So he said when societies go through major change in terms of diversity, it creates this ontological anxiety. Now what people do with that anxiety is determined not by themselves. People don't go into a closet and pray or meditate on this. They actually listen to their leaders. They are given stories. They're given narratives. They're told what it means. And so the role of leaders is quite important. And the leaders actually help generate a national story. And there's always more than one story. So one of the big stories is that we are who we are. And these people are threatening the soul of America. These pe people are destroying the fabric of who we are. And we should be afraid of them. We should tell them to go home. I mean, as Trump says, there are rapists and murderers coming over the border every day. We should be afraid of them. Uh, we should build a wall. We should send them back home. That's called bonding, where you actually create a tight circle around a group of people and basically say everyone else outside that circle is other. They don't really belong. There's another story which says we are connected to each other and we're connected. We're different. We're not the same, but we're still fundamentally connected. Uh, and out of that comes a sense of belonging, empathy, and even love. There were the ability to actually connect with each other. And that's called bridging. And that's a story that's not told so often in the United States anymore. It first have to engage the sense of people's anxiety. Yes, it's hard to deal with people who worship differently than we do, who think differently than we do. I spent some time in Africa, uh, did some postgraduate work there. And, you know, most differences we have, we don't recognize until we are in a place where those differences become very salient. So there are hundreds of ways in which we were odd without knowing that we were odd until we got there. Things from reaching into the communal bowl for food with our left hand, which is never, 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 never done. Um, the left hand is what you use to clean yourself. You would never reach into a communal bowl. And the people in Africa, we're in Tanzania, they didn't believe that we didn't know that. How could someone not know that? To them, that's just universal knowledge. That's, I mean, it's like you're adding insult to injury. You do something really terrible and then pretend that you're stupid. We weren't pretend, we really were stupid. <laughs> uh, but you see stuff like that all the time. I was in India and in a small village and doing some work and doing some teaching. And there's a lot of India, and this was in the 1980s, who didn't believe in germs. And so they went to serve me water and they went to the middle of this big vat of water and they took the lid off and there was scum on the top of the water. And they wiped away the scum and they got ready to serve me the water. And I guess my face must have said something like, ah. <laughs> and they looked at me and they said, you're not one of those Americans that believe in germs, are you? <laughs> I said, of course not. <laughs> but my religion requires that I boil water. And, I said, <laughs> and we got along famously. So 
things, the thing is, we, if you don't travel, if you stay in your place, it's easy to think your way of doing things is the only way. Uh, and not to build those bridges or to be afraid when people come who might do things a little different than us. This is actually the dominant issue in the United States and in much of the world today. The world is changing. Hundreds of millions of people are moving. By the end of this century, the end of the 21st century, it's projected that there'll be no major city in the world, not Stockholm, not Moscow, uh, that will be majority white. Now that's something that people can't wrestle with by themselves. What does that mean? I don't know. But I can tell you this, it means something. And what it means depends on what we do, the stories we tell, do we build resources and commitments and communities that allow people to bridge? And do we do it in a way that don't beat people up for, billing, for feeling uncomfortable, for feeling anxious? There's been a different way of measuring what's happening in your mind. It's not the Freudian way. You don't ask people. You don't sit people down and talk to them about their dreams. We have now have access to the unconscious in ways that we never had years ago. And this right here represents asking Americans, uh, does America becoming less white bother you? And the blue line on top, and I don't know if you can see this from where you are, but the blue line on top is what the conscious mind says. And you can see in every case the conscious mind says, oh, you know, about 13% say, well, you know, it bothers me a little bit, it's not that big a deal. The unconscious mind is saying, oh, buddy, this is a problem. <laughs> the unconscious mind is radically politically incorrect. It doesn't care. And the thing that's interesting, and I'll make this information available to you, uh, it's extreme, not just among quote-unquote conservatives, these differences between how the conscious mind reacts to diversity and how the unconscious mind reacts to diversity is almost the most extreme among liberals. So all of us are struggling with this question. I was at a meeting in Minneapolis and it was black businessmen, black elected officials, black educators. And we're talking about really heavy topics. Um, talking about the economy, talking about the environment, talking about how to make Minneapolis and Minnesota a more welcoming place. And we had this wonderful meeting. And we we're about to break. And then we're talking about how to make sure if we can fix the economy, if we can fix the schools, that blacks don't get left out which happens too often, that marginalized people, even when you fix the systems, those marginalized people get left out once again. So we're saying, we gotta make sure that, yes, we fix the overall system, but blacks don't get left out. And so they were, we were about to break, and one person said, but you know, those Nigerians, they're not really black. And then somebody said, amen, brother. And those Jamaicans, man, they ain't even close to being black. And they just went, and pretty soon it's like, and I said, whoa, stop. Do you hear what you're saying? And what they really were saying is that we have this large influx of people from the Caribbeans and from Africa who are certainly black by almost any measure, but they were saying they are different than us and we're uncomfortable with them. So this anxiety is not limited to conservatives. It's not limited to white people. It's something that virtually all people Putnam's research was in Europe. So we should expect, you should expect that as you become more diverse, and I know you're experiencing that right now, it won't necessarily be easy. So even if people say, oh yes, I like diversity, you should say, and what does your unconscious say about that? <laughs> and if they give you the answer, you should ask the next question, how do you know? Because we don't have direct access to our unconscious. So part of the thing for you to think about is how do you deal with these issues around racial inequity? How does it affect planners, philanthropy? How does it affect your boards? How do you talk to people about these issues, about racial equity? And 
I know, actually Don said, people don't like to talk about race. And Don, I would almost agree with you. And my friends often say that in Berkeley. And I always say, you mean not people, you mean white people. <laughs> I mean, white people are people too, but they're not all the people. Because most black people I know, uh, and certainly most Latinos, they may frame it differently, they have no problem talking about race. When we think of the people who are uncomfortable talking about race, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, it's white people. We might ask, why is that? What's about whiteness that makes it hard to talk about race? I don't know. I'm not white. Uh, <laughs> we live in structures, and those structures matter. And the structures are not neutral. And so part of the thing in terms of understanding structures is both understanding how structures work and understanding where we live within those structures, where we live within stories. I'm old enough to remember growing up in movies, a black person never lived to the end of the movie. Now, most of you don't think about that. Most of you don't think about, I get to see someone who looks like me at the beginning of the movie, and that person is there at the end of the movie. What an amazing thing. But if you're black in America, and I would dare say if you're Native American in America, a black person or Native American or Latino, they were just there for props. They, were, and they, didn't, they didn't make it past the first scene. Those are stories we tell. Um, if you had a woman in a movie, she was there serving coffee or maybe having sex, but she wasn't playing a significant role. So we're sending messages all the time. And the unconscious is actually taking those messages and doing something with it. Saskia Saskin has written a book called Expulsion, which I would recommend, says that something's happening, not just in the United States, she writes about what's happening all around the world. And she says, literally, we're expelling people outside their society. I talk about the circle of human concern. She talks about the processes we're using all around the world to push people outside of society. Part of the way we talk about things affect the way we think about things. So in the United States for the last 50 years, there's been a shift. We've talked about the public and private. Before 1965, the public was good. Now the public is not considered good. And we believe public schools are not good, public hospitals are not good, public transportation is not good. Uh, and there's a racialized reason for this. The racialized reason is that as the civil rights movement progressed and blacks and Latinos and other groups fought their way into public space, at some point the dominant society, the white society says, okay, you can have the public space. You can have the public schools in Detroit. We're leaving. And we said, where y'all going? And many people said, to the suburbs. And some blacks said, can we come? And y'all said, no. <laughs> uh, and so, literally, when I grew up in Detroit, it was Detroit. It later became the inner city. And the inner city is like a horror movie. Uh, so someone says, you know, Sally Jane, she was such a wonderful girl but we haven't seen her for a long time. And they said, what happened to Sally Jane? They said, I don't know, but the last time I saw her, she was going to the inner city. You know, it's just like a monster movie, right? <laughs> uh, bad things happen in the inner city. San Francisco, where I just moved from recently, doesn't have an inner city. Inner city means black. Inner city means Latino. Inner city means non-white. It's a way of saying, Something's bad, and every white person should now leave. It has become the inner city. So we have this thing that we actually denigrated the public because people of color have come into the public as a result of the civil rights movement. And so now it's like, the private is good. Turn everything over to the private. The private industry, the private market, 
the public can't do anything. And in that, we actually denigrate not only the public, we also denigrate government. So it's an attack on space, and it's an attack on function. And what I'm suggesting here is that instead of a split between the public and private, there's actually four quadrants instead of two. Those four quadrants are public, private, non-public and non-private, and corporate. And what we see happening is that the corporate had smuggled itself. This is actually a slight misrepresentation. The corporate has smuggled itself into the private. So when we say private, we actually mean corporate. Turn it over to the private. Do they mean turn it over to you? No, they mean to turn over to corporations. And that's a big deal. Now, when the founders of this country were putting stuff together, they were concerned about the public and they understood the public as where we engage in collective action. But they also understood that in that collective action, the public will amass a great amount of power. And we have to be careful about the use of that power against individuals. And so they created a sense of privacy where the government was constrained, where you could retreat to and drink your beer, smoke your weed, be left alone. So the private was always meant by Jefferson and all them of individuals and small artisans. But there were two other spheres. One was non-public, non-private, and the fourth was corporate. And they understood these spheres as being separate. The non-public, non-private is probably the most counterintuitive. What was the non-public, non-private sphere? Well, it was a big sphere. It was the sphere where women hung out. It was the sphere where slaves hung out. And in that sphere, you had no right to participate in the public discourse, nor did you have a right to retreat into a private space not being surveilled. So think about it. A woman couldn't vote. And I say, the castle, the, the house may have been the man's castle, but it was the one, woman's dungeon. The man literally held the woman as an extension of himself and property. Uh, and so it wasn't a happy space for women. And women had to fight to change that. And then you had the corporate space. And the corporate space was seen initially as an extension of government. Corporations didn't become separate from government until about the Civil War. And initially they were simply an expression of government. And what we have happening now is that corporations are claiming the private space. They're claiming they should be treated like people. They should be given the right to vote. They should be given the right to... It's, it's interesting. I won't take you through all the history because we don't have time. Uh, but when Justice Marshall wrote the case to begin to separate the co corporations from government, people were very upset. When we talk about Citizens United, people were organized in the street. These were main, plain, everyday people, not scholars, not lawyers. They were saying, this is terrible. This is going to destroy America. There's a passage where Lincoln talks about he's more afraid of corporate power than he is of the Confederate Army. He saw this as a tremendous threat to our democracy. But when Marshall wrote the opinion separating corporations from government and giving them more prerogative and power, he said, but don't worry, because they will never be able to affect the political system. <laughs> non-public, non-private. So I talk about slaves and women. You might say, well, that was a long time ago. Women can now vote. They can run for office, they can run schools, they can do a lot of things. They might even be able to be president, who knows? Uh, and we've almost ended slavery. I say almost, because most people don't realize, show of hands, how many people think we ended slavery with the Civil War? Okay, a few, a few hands. 
just bringing you into this a little bit. So when do you think the United States ended slavery? Just not yet. Why not yet? Why? Okay, private prisons. Now, that's all very close, and, and, but let me be a little more specific. The constitutional amendment that changed slavery was the 13th Amendment. It's a very short amendment. And it says, involuntary servitude in the United States shall be unconstitutional, except if someone is convicted, properly convicted of a crime accept and that acceptance has become huge and so the the very thing that would end slavery says we're going to end slavery except for this one category called people incarcerated that have exploded and so you get no protection from slavery if you're incarcerated today the people that are in the non-public non-private space and people in the non-public, non-private space are not people. We don't see them as people. We see them as something else. Slaves were seen as property. Women were an extension of property. And that was explicit. And today, when we don't see people as part of the public and private space, at an unconscious level, we don't see them as, prop as people. Who are those people today? I mean, really, do we still have people in the non-public, non-private space? Yes. They are undocumented immigrants. They are ex-offenders. They are homeless. What's the private space for a homeless person? What's the public space? And once again, we don't see them as people. We don't see them as part of us. If you read Dred Scott, which is a long case, uh, the court went to great length to say blacks could never be, could never be part of the political community. Interesting, Dred Scott was about slavery, but the court went beyond slavery. And he says, not just slaves can never be part of the political community, but blacks, whether you're free or otherwise, can never be part of this political community. Now think about that. So think about if, you, if you've been influenced by Dred Scott and all of a sudden there's a black person showing up in the White House and he's not interviewing for a job to be the cook. It might be a little disturbing. It's like, no, no, no. Blacks can't be a part of the political community. And then there's some guy who has the audacity to think he can actually be president. Well, for a lot of white people in America, this is very dislocating. There were literally people who said, after Obama won the president, they could not get out of bed. And not only was he black, he was not born in the United States. <laughs> Hell, he was born in Hawaii. <laughs> Are you scared yet? He's also a Muslim. So, and a socialist. And what else? I mean, bad. <laughs> Let's just say that. And basically, what the leaders are saying, the birthers are saying, what Donald Trump has said, he, I, he said, I'd like to see the birth certificate. And when Obama produces a birth certificate, what do they say? Oh, everybody has one of those phony birth certificates. I want to see a real birth certificate. Okay. So my point is, is that what they're saying to people is you should be afraid of this person. He's not like us. He doesn't care about us. And somehow his presence in the White House is going to destroy America. So we move from different ways in which we think and do race in the United States. Racing is a practice. It's not an adjective. It's not describing the way someone looks. It's describing what we do. Race is a verb. And the way we organize and do race today is we move from slavery to Jim Crow, and now we do it largely spatially. 
we organize people into different spaces. And we do it by making some spaces attractive and some spaces unattractive. And the inner city is not an attractive space. So what we've done, starting at Kerwin and now at Berkeley, is we do something called opportunity mapping, where we can map out space, we can map out where are their resources and how those resources are collectively organized to enhance or retard people's life chances. And then we overlay that onto populations. And these structures not only determine what people get, but also who people are. And there's something called the neighborhood effect. That if you live in a very distressed neighborhood, it has a negative impact on your life outcome. You actually can map out how long someone will live, not based on the food they eat, but by on the physical environment, on their zip code. We're organizing life chances based on space. So what may be causing the lack of support for marginalized groups here in Humboldt County? Well, I want to talk a little bit about implicit bias and othering. And if it's implicit, how do you know it exists? Again, we can actually see the effects of it, we can measure it, uh, and it has powerful impacts in terms of how we organize resources. And it's not just race, we do it across a number of axes. Abilities, sexual orientation, class, skin tone, size. And it affects what we see and how we feel about people on an unconscious level. So I want to play a couple of games with you because whenever we talk about the unconscious, a lot of people feel like, well, my partner may not be conscious of what's going on, but I do. I know what's going on. We think the unconscious is for people who are ne'er-do-wells. You know, if you're really educated, then you're conscious. Um, and it turns out that uh, all of us, all of us are deeply impacted by what's happening at unconscious level. So for the next few slides, I want to introduce you and try to get you to see how the unconscious works. So first of all, do you see a figure up on the slide? And what is the figure that you see up there? Pac-Man? Triangle? A triangle and Pac-Man. Okay. For those of you who see Pac-Man, great. For those who see a triangle, great. The reality is there's no triangle up there. Your mind projects a triangle. The white that's up there is of a uniform color. And yet, the unconscious fills in the uniform color so that oftentimes people see a triangle. Now I'm going to play a different game with you. This game is pretty simple. I'm going to go at an even clip. And as I go at this clip, I'm going to show you some colors. When you see the colors, I'm going to ask you to say it out loud. And some of the colors will be letters or words, but I'm asking you to ignore the letters and words. We're not interested in letters and words. The only thing we're interested in this exercise is the color. Is that clear? Yes. Think you could do that? All right, great. So here we go. And say it out loud. You did so well on the first line. <laughs> you seemed to have trouble as we got into the second and third line. Why was it harder when you got into the second and third line? 
implicit bias. You don't like playing this game? What's, what's the bias? <laughs> you were reading the words. Wait a minute, though. Just, just a minute. I thought we had an agreement. <laughs> the agreement was you were not going to read the words. Didn't you say that? Were you not telling the truth? <laughs> so the reality is you cannot turn your unconscious off. You can not want to see the words, but you see the words and you're unconsciously reading them and your conscious and your unconscious are in a tug with each other and it slows you down. When you do this for an extended period of time, it creates something they call cognitive depletion. It actually makes you tired. Um, so again, the unconscious is fast. It's unruly. And it's politically incorrect. What does this have to do with race or gender or sexual orientation? We can, there's something called the Harvard Implicit Association Test, and this is part of it. And what they can show is that most Americans see race, see gender, see whether or not someone's able body, and it affects them, even if they don't want to. So when people say, you know what, I really don't even notice race. I mean, I am so colorblind, you wouldn't believe it. And I say, you're right, I don't believe it. <laughs> uh, it's not that you're lying, it's that you're only reporting your conscious behavior. And you, we can take tests, and the, again, invite you to take the Harvard Implicit Associate test, Association test, and we can see that the unconscious is operating. And so even when you're in, you know, frankly, all white communities say, I have no racial animus. I don't even know any Latinos or black people. Okay. <laughs> okay, take the test. One more. How many of you see a square with the letter A in it and a square with the letter B in it? Okay. Which one is darker, A or B? Okay, how many think A is darker? Raise your hand. How many think B is darker? How many people don't care? <laughs> right. Okay, but don't care is have it. Uh, the majority of people think A is darker. Now, I've already done a couple of things with this, so you probably know that this is a trick. Because A and B are exactly the same shade. So why, if A and B are exactly the same shade, do the majority of people see A being darker than B? What's going on? There's a shadow. There's a context. There's, there's a context. You're basically, your unconscious is looking at patterns and making leaps. You're filling in the blank. You expect to see something and therefore you see it. So it's not seeing is believing, it's believing is seeing. My uh, advancer is stuck. So I don't know why. If anyone, technician, could help move the advancer to the next slide. So uh, the unconscious is actually very big, as I suggested. The conscious is very small. The unconscious is very, very fast. The conscious is actually quite slow. We're having some problems with here. Technical difficulties. So, how big is the conscious compared to the unconscious. The conscious process about 40, 40 
bits of information a second. During that same second, the unconscious process 11 million bits of information. I use the analogy that, think about if you built a highway so that 40 cars a second could travel on that highway. And instead, here comes 11 million cars a second. You would have a traffic jam that would be decades long. The importance of that is that you cannot control your unconscious. It is too big, it is too fast. If we tried to do everything at a conscious level, we can't, but if we try, we would not survive. We literally would die out as a species. And the unconscious learns largely by associations. So when things happen rapidly, close and close proximity and repeatedly, the unconscious draws with a neural network. It literally creates a neural pathway between two events. So you ring a bell and you feed the dog. You ring a bell and you feed the dog. You ring a bell, and the dog starts to salivate because the dog has recognized that there's a relationship between the bell and food. Of course, there is no relationship. In science, we'd say there's a correlation, maybe, but no causation. The unconscious is like Pavlov's dog. When we see things happening over and over again in close proximity, we actually create an unconscious link that says causation. Now, how does that relate to race? How does that relate to gender? How does that relate to any number of things? In the United States, we have, we see about 5,000 images a day. And we can now measure what images are fired together. So what, when you see black on television, the image of violence is almost, and poverty is closely associated with it. When you see Latino on television, the image of not caring about school, being hard workers, but not too bright, is closely associated with it. Now these images are fired, and everyone in our society, by and large, are exposed to these images. Not just whites, everyone. And so the unconscious mind is drawing a relationship. And in drawing that relationship, when it sees a black face, it unconsciously thinks in terms of guns and violence. Now the facts of the matter is that white, and white males in particular, are the most likely group to own guns, and most likely group, group to be involved in gun violence. But the unconscious is not interested in facts, it's not interested in data, it's not a researcher. It's just, you fire things together, the unconscious draws a neural network. And that's how it learns. It does it automatically. And it does it in part for survival, and it does it so that we can process large chunks of information together. Uh, and it allows us to do other things more or less efficiently. efficiently. <laughs> I think so. What's this? What's this? We can go. This is all right. I think this is where we left off here. Hopefully, don't go too far. <laughs> okay, so I want to give you a couple of more teases with the unconscious. Um, and we won't keep you too late. This is a video. Uh, so how do we get this video to show? <laughs> hey. John, just hover over the video. I don't know how to hover. <laughs> this is not my computer. How do I get the cursor up? Oh, maybe that's it. Oh, here you go. This is an awareness test. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! Answer 
is 13. The answer is 13. But did you see the moon but walking bear? But did you see the moon walking bear? <laughs> So I take it by, uh, hopefully this next one will work as well, I take it by your laughter that many of you didn't see the bear the first time. Uh, now this woman up front saw the bear, she's, but now this, she's seen it before, but those of you who've seen the bear, if you, if you notice, if you see the bear, you don't count. Your ability to do things consciously is extremely small. So what I did, what they did, is they exhausted your conscious ability. Your 40 bits were exhausted. Now, you did see the bear because you got 11 million bits unconsciously. You were just not conscious of it. Um, I don't know if we have the right ones up here. Okay. I don't think we have the right ones up here, but um, they are what we can do is show you something subliminally and then show you that it affects you even when you can't see it. So we will, I have some slides where we can flash something and in this case, I'll tell you what it is since I don't have it, we flash a picture, we flash a picture, you can't see what it is, we flash another picture, you can't see what it is. The first picture is a picture of a white man, but you can't see it, remember? The second picture is a picture of a black man. You still can't see it. Now, in each case, we flash, we show you a degraded gun. And each slide, the gun becomes less degraded. So here's the experiment. When you've seen subliminally the picture, the black picture, the picture of the black man, your ability to identify the gun speeds up. So you see something, you know what it is, and you're looking at this something that's bay, you can't really quite make out, ah, oh, that's a gun. When you see subliminally the picture of the white man, your ability to identify the gun actually slows down. What's going on is that subliminally your unconscious has been primed, and so now your unconscious is actually looking for violence because you've seen a black man and your unconscious has a neural network between a black face and violence. There's another experiment like this where we put different objects in someone's hand. They call it the shooter experiment. Uh, and in one experiment, you put, you put a cell phone in someone's hand. And if the person holding the cell phone is black, we are oftentimes misidentify the cell phone as a gun. And when the person is white, we oftentimes misidentify the gun as a cell phone. I could say a lot more about it, but think about this in terms of the police. They see a black person running down the street with an object in his hand. And I say, I swear he had a gun. And we say, you just racist. He didn't have a gun. No, but I swear I saw a gun. And we can show, we work with police, and we say, many of the police, some people are racist. Let's just get that out, okay? Some people are consciously racist. But a lot of people are not consciously racist. But their unconscious has been primed. And so, if they see a black person, they're more likely to see a gun, even when they have a cell phone. And if you're police, similarly. And so, one other example, taken away from police, because we think of blacks as violent, teachers in schools, when two students act out, one white, one black, they are act oftentimes not primed to notice the black, excuse me, the white person acting out, and overly primed to notice the black person acting out. And so again, why are you punishing all these black boys? Because they're acting out. And when we see the difference in terms of punishment, it cannot be explained in terms of behavior. What's going on, and people are primed, 
and they, they actually notice it. And these are good people, right? And some of them even might be black teachers. Some of the police might even be black police because all of us are having these 5,000 images come at us every day. Now they are stronger in terms of whites than blacks because whites don't have a counter-stereotypical experience. I go home periodically and see my dad. My dad is one of the nicest, most non-violent people you'll meet. So when I get these images, they're, they're competing with my image of my dad. So it dampens the effect of it. But most white people don't have any contact with black people. So the only contact they have are the 5,000 images that they're getting every day. Most Christians don't have any contact with Muslims. So the only contact they're getting is the 5,000 images they get every day. We don't have many stereotypical, anti-counter-stereotypical uh, examples because we live in structurally such a racially segregated space. Um, I'm going to skip some slides, get us to the end. We lost a little time and I want to get us out on time. Um, what the unconscious does, it sorts into categories, it creates associations between things, and it fills in the gaps. And it collects things into bundles called schemas. Another way of saying building associations. It does this automatic. The solution that we would have suggested maybe in the 1990s is just see everybody as an individual. Don't see people by their race, by their gender, by their sexual orientation. Just see people as individuals. Any serious social psychologist, neuropsychologist will tell you that's a fool's errand. It's simply not possible. That's not the way the mind is constructed. Now, does that mean that we all are hopelessly and forever racist? No. To have these associations doesn't mean we are unconsciously racist. It means we have these associations, and it means they will affect our behavior unless we do something to counteract it. But we can do something. Uh, and it's not just race, we have similar associations around gender, around religion, around sexual orientation, around any salient category in our society. I want to introduce you to one other concept, and then I'm going to go to the end of the presentation and get ready to close out. And that is comes from something called stereotype threat. This is work by Claude Steele. And the basic gist is that when you are in an environment where you don't feel like you belong and there's a stereotype operating in society, it affects you and the group around you. An example. We have found, and this is something Claude did, he brought a bunch of women at Stanford, PhD students, pretty bright, uh, most of them Asian American, and he primed them. Here's the prime, two primes, first prime. I love teaching here at Stanford because there's so many bright women. 30 minutes later, 20 minutes later, I'm going to give you a pop quiz today. He gives them a math test. They bomb the test. They don't do well at all. He brings in a second group of women with exactly, and I underscore, exactly the same ability. This time, he gives them a different prime. The prime is, I love here, teaching here at Stanford because there's so many bright Asian American women. 30 minutes later, he gives them the exact same test. They ace it. How do you explain that? Well, what happens is that in the first group, he activates their womanness. And they are aware, like most of us, unconsciously, that women are not supposed to be good at math. And it creates a threat. And that threat interferes with their performance. In the second group, he activates their Asian Americanness. And they are aware, unconsciously, that Asian Americans are supposed to be good at math. And they perform well at math. Now, the thing about this, he does this for every group. And he does it, you can read about it in a book called Whistling Vivaldi. So one group he brings in, he says, 
There's a group of white men and black men. And he says, the prime is this, the first prime. You know, we're going to go play some golf today. But before we go play, just remember that golf, people think golf is how strong you are, how much muscle you have. That's nothing to do with it. Golf is all about mental acuity, about strategy, about being focused. Now go play. The second prime, he says, you know what? People overthink golf. It's really about being comfortable in your body, your rhythm, your flow. In the first group, the white men exceed and excel. The black men don't do very well. In the second group, the white men bomb. And the black men do very well. And both groups have exactly the same ability. In the context of schools, we know that when you are getting ready to test, give a standardized test, and you say, before you take the test, we want you to check your race or ethnicity. I'm checking Native American. I'm checking black. I'm checking Latino. Now, go take the standardized test. You've just depressed the performance of those students because they're aware, regardless of their ability, that those groups are not supposed to be good on standardized tests. Now you might say, well, they know they're black, or Latino, or Native American anyway. What difference does it make? It makes a huge difference. So if you prime them differently or ask the information at the end of the test, it has a huge impact. In some tests, it closes the gap between students of color and whites by 50%. The reality is we're primed all day by things that tell us we belong or that we don't belong. One of the ways you interview decrease stereotype threat are the primes. Another one is you have critical mass. If there are enough high-performing Native Americans, high-performing Latinos, high-performing blacks, they're no longer threatened by that. The point this slide is is that implicit bias is not personal. These are societal biases. These are the biases that we get by these 5,000 images a day. And these biases are likely to be more prevalent when we're operating under stress. And we don't just have these biases. They affect our behavior. They affect our bodies. So one of the things we can do is try to consciously create environments that say to people, you belong, this is your place. We do it by pictures, we do it by images. We do it by stories. We even can do it sometimes by talking about these biases out front. So how do we achieve a sense of belonging? We create role models, we help students navigate complex social environments. We improve staff and cultural competency. We have direct and measurable impact on students. We achieve critical mass. We tell stories. We embrace, we embrace, embrace belonging. We actually manage the environment and the structures to produce the outcomes that we want. We build bridges between students and between folks so that people are not seen as categorically different. We name the anxiety that people are experiencing. The federal government is trying to get into the mix and it issues guidelines for things like expulsion, suspension, uh, and when things get so out of whack, it will issue a letter saying, there's something wrong here, we need to look more carefully. But we don't have to wait for the federal government to do that, we can do that ourselves by seeing when the disparities are too far out of whack what's going on. I started off by talking about how hard it is to talk about race. And it's really hard for everyone, but hard in a different way. Oftentimes when, and we again, there's very strong empirical research on this, when white people talk about race, they feel anxious, they feel scared, they feel that they're gonna be judged, they feel that they're gonna be called a racist, and they worry about that unless they're comfortable being a racist, then they don't worry about it. 
So this is not all white people. This is only white people who don't want to be a racist. But the white people who do want to be racist, call me a racist. I'm a racist. I'm racist and proud. Uh, blacks, Latinos, Native Americans, we often feel like we're going to be invisible. We're going to have to represent. Um, and we get noticed, but we don't get seen. This is what Don was talking about. Um, Ralph Ellison wrote in the 1950s, early 60s, The Invisible Man. I was just at a party of a friend of mine who is white, um, and um, three or four hundred people. Her father was um, the head of the Atomic Energy Commission in Arizona. There weren't many blacks there. Uh, and I had, and then in the space of a half an hour, half a dozen white people to come up to tell me their racial story, to tell me about when they were in college and they had a black friend. It's like, oh, I'm really glad to hear that, you know. <laughs> My guess is they didn't tell anybody else about that. You know, I was there representing. I had the depository of all things black. Uh, and, uh, uh, and they assumed certain things that just were not appropriate. So we actually need to help people talk about race in a different way. We have to help create empathetic space. We have to help people talk about the anxieties without attacking them. Uh, we have to help people move to a different space. We have to help people with tools. And we have to think about the environment and the stories. We have to help people understand that really there is no other. Our faiths are deeply linked. Um, and we have to help people not just find common ground, but create common ground. We have to help people feel safe, which is different than feeling comfortable. These things are not necessarily comfortable, but they can be safe. This is a Zulu word, which means I see you. And it means not only do I see you, but I see your ancestors and your progeny. I see those not yet born. I see your history. And so the word Salbono means, I see you. And the answer is, I am here. Um, and as we know, Cornel Ross reminds us that justice is the public face of love. And I think if we hold this in that spirit of deep belonging and love, which allow people to make mistakes, but don't leave them making those mistakes, we can actually move forward. Power, as Don reminded us, matter. Systems thinking, implicit by all these things matter. Um, and so, we want you to join the North, uh, our North Coast, in the follow-up for this conversation. Uh, we will be having people from the Haas Institute coming here um, every quarter to help drill down and have a deep conversation about this. Um, and. You can also text it. I don't know how to do that, but <laughs> Darren does. Uh, and so we're asking you, if you do text, to put it out there right now, to start talking about what's going on, to ask people who are not here to join the conversation. And again, I want to thank you, not just for the work that you've done in the past, but for the work you will do in helping us create a future where we all belong. Thank you. Oh, I get to pick some questions. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Ah. I want to thank everybody for taking the time to be here to want to start this conversation. My name is Jen Rice with the Humboldt Area Foundation. And uh, I know we're ending uh, with the presentation uh, at 
when we said we would close tonight, if you want to stay, I would like to make about 15 minutes of space for folks to ask some questions, to dig into anything that uh, Professor Powell has shared tonight that you want to get a little more information about. Um, because this is, as he said, the start of an 18-month process that we're kicking off with lots of partners that Don mentioned at the beginning to dig into this topic in our region and start making sense of how it relates to our organizations and our institutions and how we start to change the way we operate in this community and the way we bridge uh, and the way we connect with other people. Because we do see it as a fundamental aspect to supporting everybody to thrive in our region. I do want to encourage you, there are little slips on your paper before we go to questions. Um, and if you have a question, you can go to either side of the, the room here, um, behind Laura and behind Keitra. Uh, there's some slips that are going to help us determine how many of you want to maybe debrief this conversation and dig in and help us understand what you're interested in. Uh, so that we can start planning the next conversations, the first of which is probably going to happen around the end of August. The second thing I'll ask you for is your contact information, that either that we get it in the sign-up sheet out front, or that you can go to the website, ournorthcoast.org, and share your contact information there. That way we can confirm with you when the follow-up conversation is, and we can let you know when the next talk by the Haas Institute is going to be. I don't know if we're going to get Professor Powell back here. Uh, so I would, and if you have questions, I really encourage you to ask him because this is one of the humans on the planet who knows the most about this topic. And we get to have him in this room with us. Uh, and I don't know if we'll get him back. We will get the Haas Institute back quarterly for the next 18 months. And they're going to do two things. One is offer public talks like this one. And another is to convene uh, groups of organizations and governments here to do this work together intensively. So if you're interested in that, talk to myself or my compatriot, Ron White, here uh, after this is done. So. <laughs> So with that, do folks have, oh, and I just wanted to also share about this, these presentations will be available also. Again, if we have your contact information, um, we can follow, we're going to follow up with a little survey to get feedback and um, links for more information. So with that, does anybody have questions about how we can bridge, <laughs> how we can make these concepts work in our region? Awesome. Of course, Pastor Brian does. So um, I, I have a question. Um, so I'm working on my own inner unconscious um, and hoping to be a little progressive and possibly helpful here in Humboldt County. Um, uh, and there's resistance uh, around otherness. I, I, I kind of understand and I'm working on myself to under, understand that. But uh, in the in seats of power and the Board of Supervisors and City Council in Eureka, there's a considerable amount of resistance um, to engaging the topic. And do you have any stories about how you can get folks in positions of power who are resistant to even having the conversation um, to maybe open up a little? Thank you. Um, so, you know, we need multiple entry points, multiple people to participating. Some people respond to me, some people don't respond to me. But if you find key people, including unusual suspects from the business community, from the seats of power, uh, who care about these issues, there's, there's some people who are living this day to day, their voices have to be amplified. But they can't be the only voice. This is actually a collective process. And sometimes, again, it's hard, and most of us have had some experience that didn't go well. I'll tell you one story. Uh, I was down in Austin, Texas. 
they were building a light rail line. The president of Dell Corporation showed up to the meeting. He's a six nine, uh, and he was. It was interesting because he was there. I don't know why. Maybe because he's a leader in Austin, but he clearly was grumpy. Uh, and he, I, I gave him the data about they were building a light rail line, and I showed how this light rail line was not going to serve the Latino community that was the fastest growing community in Austin. And your future workforce is the Latino community in Austin. Uh, and he said something at the end of the meeting. He said, that's stupid. He said, I actually advocated for this light rail line. I went to Washington. I got the federal government to pay for it. But to build it where it's not going to serve Latinos, which means it's not going to serve me, would be stupid. And he said, I'm calling Washington. This was on a Friday night or Saturday morning. He said, I'm calling Washington on Monday and ask them, can we resubmit our application? And if they say no, we're going to still build a light rail line in a different place and I'm going to pay for it out of my pocket. And then he said, this is one of the first times that I've talked about race that I feel good. Uh, and he gave me this big hug and he said, you ever come to Austin, you can stay at my house. <laughs> uh, and I share that story not because whatever he, but what he is saying is that I've been in many conversations about race, about ethnicity, where I have been attacked. Now he's a powerful person. He's a billionaire, but he also is a human being. And given him, and I'm not saying he's a typical human being, because I don't know what's typical about being a billionaire, uh, but he was saying, I want to do the right thing, but instead, I get in most conversations, and people spend most of the time telling me what a bad person I am. And he said, I was sick of that. He said, I didn't want to come to this meeting. And instead, you gave concrete data, you showed how this was going to affect us, the workforce. I'm all in. And I'd like to be a friend. So that won't happen every time, but I think his voice in Austin is much more important than my, vo my voice in Austin. He can go places I can never go. Uh, so part of it is getting some of the unusual suspects to actually show how and why this is important for the entire community, especially for the marginalized community, but for the entire community, for the economy. Uh, and oftentimes we don't do that. So, um, and I think, as I said, when we talk about race, when we talk about, oftentimes everybody walk away kind of feeling badly. And then you say, like Jan just said, come back next month, we're going to do this again. <laughs> and I don't think so. Uh, so you have to, I mean, you have to be real. There's some hard issues we're dealing with. People are dying every day. Uh, but you also have to create a space where people can feel okay, where people can relate to each other, where people can actually care and love, about, love each other. And I know that may sound a little unusual, but that's what brings people back. People want to connect. And if you can help them, um, and there are a lot of people out there that are doing that. I mean, I live in the Bay Area, and as you know, Mark Zuckerberg said he's going to give away at least $44 billion before he die. And People in the social justice community say, oh, he's full of BS. I say, well, but he still said he's going to give away $44 billion. Maybe we should have a conversation with him. And I think uh, some of you may not know, but I'm a consultant to Apple. I do consult. I have access to people like Tim Cook. Doesn't make him or me a great guy, but I can at least try to talk to him. He's trying to do something. How far he will go, I don't know. But as you know, Apple is still either the number one or number two richest company in the world. Um, and when I leave here, I'm going to, to train Apple in Europe. Um, I don't know how far I can push him, but so part of this is being those conversations with people. Uh, in the meeting we had over lunch today with the business community, the uh, education community, the uh, um, elected officials, um, I think there needs to be more community. People are starting to have a conversation about structures, about institutions, about the future, and how we can do it together. So I, I appreciate your question, and I think that the thing that we're talking about will give you more tools to do the very thing you asked for. Yeah, 
Yeah, I wanted to ask you for some time, um, how do you relate race to being like gravity? How do you what? How do you relate race to being like gravity? Great question. You know, first of all, I have to tell you, um, I love that, I love that, um, that metaphor. Um, I was a physics major when I went to college, and I love all things physics. Uh, so I'm a little bit of wonky in that respect, and um, most people don't like to read about physics and stuff. But anyway, so the, this is what physics say, physics say, physicists say. We all have weight. We more or less know what it is. But only about 12 to 15 people in the world really understand gravity. Gravity is hopelessly complicated. Now, most of us, we don't need to understand it. We just need to know how much we weigh, more or less. I think race is like gravity, in that we all have a race, we all have opinions, we all have common knowledge, a common sense, and a good deal of it is wrong. That race is so incredibly complicated. Um, and it's, it's not that it's, I should say, it's not that it's rocket science, it's harder than rocket science. Plus, we have an emotional attachment to it. So we have a vested interest in it not being a certain way, and it being a certain way. We don't want to unearth certain questions because it would interrupt our sense of our country, our sense of ourselves. Uh, in the United States, we sort of divide these questions up between big questions like the environment, big questions like the economy, and then we sort of ghettoize or narrow those questions about social justice and race, and that's what the people of color do. The really heavy people deal with the big questions about the environment, and it's like, I'm saving the world. You're trying to save the black community. Okay, fine, whatever. Uh, what I believe, and I talk about this some in my book, but I, is that we cannot save the world, we cannot save our economy, we cannot save our political system without understanding race. The race affects everything. Uh, and I'll just give you two quick examples. Electoral college, which is not the way to do a democracy if you want a democracy. Uh, what most people don't understand is the reason we have the electoral college primarily is so that we can enhance the power of slave masters in slave states. The three-fifths clause in the Constitution that we rail against is that it, gave, it only counted blacks as three-fifths of a person in the Constitution. It didn't count blacks as a person at all. The, the Constitution we wanted, if we're going to have a slave state, was for blacks not to count. Because what it counted for, it enhanced the power and the electoral votes that went to slave states. So you got to count all the white people, and then every slave counted as a three-fifths of a person to give the white slave master more power and to give small states more power. So the four of the five first presidents of the United States came from Virginia, which was the largest slave-holding state at the time. Uh, and many of them, including Thomas Jefferson, would not have gotten elected without the three-fifths clause. Now we fast forward, and we're still seeing, and most people are like, why do we have this thing called the Electoral College never heard of it. And if you go back and look at the design of many institutions in our country that affect all of us, they were highly motivated by protecting the institution of slavery. I'll just give you one more. Before Lincoln, the Owl in Congress was not divided by Democrats and Republicans, the big question in the country was pro-slavery, anti-slavery. That was the defining issue in the country. It affected everything. It affected whether we we're going to have banks. It affected voting. Uh, and we're still living with many of those institutions today, and people don't know why we have them. Um, the two books I'd recommend, one is called Fighting Poverty in the United States a world and Europe, A World of Difference. And they try to understand why was the United States so hard about getting a welfare state? And the other one is half of the story that's never been told. Um, and actually, I'll give you one more. Uh, fear itself. Um, so 
Fear itself, which is written by Katz Nelson, he writes, during the New Deal, the federal government said, we're going to have public works and it's not going to be segregated. The South was apoplectic. You mean we're going to have places where we don't get to dominate blacks? And the federal government said, yes, that's what public works is. And the South was so upset that they introduced the idea that the federal government should never be able to create jobs again. Leave it to the market. Fast forward, we just had the, the largest downturn in U.S. history since the New Deal, since the, Decre the Great Depression. Millions of people out of work. We have a black man in the White House, President Obama, and someone says, well, what about the idea of the federal government creating jobs? Obama's response is, we all agree that the federal government should never create jobs. That's the role of the market. We're the only country in the world that holds that position. That's not an economic position. That's an ex a position that came from being anxious about blacks having jobs on equal footing for white. My guess is President Obama either doesn't know or forgotten that history. And so what I'm saying is that when you understand how powerful slavery, race, racism, othering has been in terms of shaping our institutions, it becomes incredibly complicated. Um, and if we're going to fix our institutions, if we're going to have a society and world that's worth living, we have to fix that. We have to realize that old saying that I am because you are. And that cuts across racial lines, it cuts across uh, ethnic lines, it cuts across religious lines. Um, and so that's why I think othering in the United States, one of the primary ways to other is race, is the issue for the 21st century. If we're going to save the environment, we cannot do it without understanding how these issues are profoundly racialized. One last question. Okay, so I'm a firm believer that our children are going to be what changes our future. So I would like to know what kind of skills you suggest that I would um, instill in my children to make an empathetic space um, to help decrease racism. That's a great question. It's, uh, it's uh, and I hate to keep doing this, but that's what I'm paid to do. I'm going to give you a book. <laughs> it's called The Hidden Brain. And it's written, Lars, The Hidden Brain. Um, and I, I, I have to disclose, so you don't think I'm just a hopelessly ego, egomaniac, I'm a star in the book. Uh, the, the, um, the guy who wrote the book followed me and some other people around for a year uh, in terms of doing this work, and, he, and that's partially what the book is written about. But that's not why I'm suggesting it. I'm suggesting it because he deals a lot with the issues of implicit bias in children. Uh, and also I would invite you to go to our website at the Haas Institute or Perception Institute. Um, there's also uh, um, uh, something you can get offline, you don't have to buy, it. it's called The Science of Equality. Again, I'm one of the co-writers of that, uh, but there's a whole chapter on children and education. It's really important, I feel badly about not giving it due, but those are some resources. Our children are going to be in, living in a different space than we're in. Uh, and they need help. And I think we should actually pay very close attention to what's going on. The brain is very placid, meaning it moves, it changes, it grows, it creates new neural networks. Um, and what we do matters. It matters so much. Um, and I, you know, as I said, I'm a little wonky, so I'm in with this. I think. Um, two things. The country is changing very fast. Um, and I've used this before. In 2010, 15% of the marriages in the United States are what's called intermarriages, meaning people married across racial or ethnic lines. Uh, in 2010, uh, 15%. In California, 2010, that number was 23%. The projection is that in a relatively short period of time, 20 to 40 years, it will be much higher. During that same period, 2010, 40% of families were interfamilies. 40% higher in California. 50% of the families had someone of a different race or ethnicity in the family. Um, 
Just a quick show of hand. How many of you are described by that data? Raise your hand. The vast majority. Uh, what that means to our children is not automatic. It doesn't mean like that's a panacea. We're not going to all become beige. Uh, but it means that we actually, there's a growing community that wants a different space. I'm sure many of you have seen the Old Navy ad that's creating a stir on the internet. And if you haven't, Google it. It's an interracial couple, and the right wing is going crazy. They're saying, take that stuff down. It's misogynistic. You're promoting interracial marriage. Take it down. And Old Navy has said no. And even, even John McCain's son has gotten into the act, and he's post with his black wife saying, if you don't like it, eat it. I mean... <laughs> Uh, but this is what's happening in America. It's happening all over in America, but we haven't created a space to hold it or talk about it or turn it into something really progressive. So I think there's an opportunity with our children. We won't do race the same, but we are likely to do it. And how we do it matters. So I'll end with this question that I said, a trick question, but it's a real question. I've given you one number, 11 million. Second number, 10 to the 10th power which means uh, 10 with 10 zeros after it. And the last number, 10 to the 100th power. What is the first number I've already given you? 11 million, how many bits your unconscious can process in a second? What is 10 to the 10th power? Close, but it's the number of atoms in the universe. The number of atoms in the universe, 10 to the 10 power. 10 to the 100 power is the number of neural connections. So think about that. The number of atoms in the universe, 10 to the 10 power, our brain is capable of making, I mean, it's, it's such a big number. They asked a hard note physicist, what do you think about when you think about that number, 10 to the 10th power? And he says, it's hurt, it hurts my brain. The only thing I can think about when I think about that, and I'm an atheist, is God. Uh, and so what we do with our children will actually determine how those neural connections get made. Because uh, they're placid, they're not set. They're not set by culture, they're not set by genes. The, the, the most elegant thing in the world in terms of complexity, in terms of plasticity, is the human brain. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. If you have comments you want to share on your way out, please do. And then leave us your contact information as well. And we'll give you more opportunity to tell us what you think and what more you want to know. Good night. <laughs>